Welcome to the Pommy Podcast. Before we get on with the show, we would like to thank our sponsors, RossTheMortgageBroker.com. Save money on your current mortgage or find out what your borrowing power is. Either hit the link in the description or use the QR code on the screen. Now on to the episode. I'm a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy Podcast. My guest today is actually a former colleague and business partner, Mr. Mark Lovell. How are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Long time no speak. Yeah, looking forward to getting into it and uh, yeah, catching up a- along the way with um, along the journey so, of the podcast, I guess. So a, a bit of a background, obviously, me and Mark, um, well, Mark signed me up to the military. So <laughs> I walked into the careers office one day. I was hoping to join the Royal Air Force. As I arrived, they gave me a five-year wait um, to, I think it was peak credit crunch, right? It was 2009, 2010, sort of peak yeah. sort of credit crunch. And um, the everyone was just joining the military for like a stable job. Um, so I, I'd left college, um, 18 years of age, and walked into the careers office and Mark had injured himself and he was sat in the careers office uh, and they basically said to me, yeah, Ross, you've been put on a five-year waiting list. And I was like, well, what the fuck am I going to do? My mum's moving to Dubai next month. And then Mark uh, basically was like, oh, this is an opportunity to uh, hire for the Royal Marines, <laughs> which I'd never heard of at the time, actually, to be fair. Um but yeah, before we get into all of that, um, talk to me about what was life sort of like growing up for you? Um, we, did you grow up in Suffolk? Yeah, I was in Haver, Haverhill, Suffolk. Um, yeah, from, from, yeah, born in Cambridge and then just always from Haverhill. Um, what was life like? Um, no, I had a lovely, I had a good upbringing really. Um, Looking back from the journey, which we'll probably get into, what well, we definitely will get into, I, I look back at my upbringing as probably, I couldn't, when I was younger, and when people asked me, why did I join the Royal Marines? Like, I couldn't work out why myself, but then later on, I've done counselling and stuff like that that we'll probably go into. I can now see probably why. Um, I was brought up in a very, very loving family, but it was just my mum mainly and my nan. Um my dad left. Um, he had a, he's got a crazy story himself. Um, and he went abroad, you know, he went, went to prison at times. Uh, and my mum and dad were complete opposites. So my mum was this, wouldn't do anything wrong ever, very loving, caring, uh, probably sort of over-mothered me too much. And she was scared that I'd ever go down. If ever I'd done anything wrong, she'd always be like, well, you're, don't, you won't end up like your dad. You end up like your dad. And I was, I was sort of caught up in that. Very protected. I'm very loved. But also I had this burning desire to do, to go on to do things, which I think was probably stifled out of me a little bit as a youngster. Um, but yeah, that was basically my upbringing pretty much. I had a stepdad, but mainly brought up through, through my, my nans, um, because my mum worked um, and, and my mum. Mate, that's um, it's very similar to me. Yeah. Well, my dad, I know, I know, my dad was, I know a lot of your story as well, but um, yeah, yeah like my dad, my dad, that my mum and dad split up when I was three. Maybe it's a fucking marine thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, you know, it when, sad, you go, when you go in, it's a sad it? dad story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, my my I used to get dropped off at my nan's, so my mum could go and do double like a like a Sunday yeah. shift. You get paid double or whatever. So I get dropped off yeah, at my yeah. nan's on the weekends, or like if she was working late, my nan would come over and look after me or whatever, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. But and then I had a, I had a couple of I had a stepdad in the middle of that who was who was probably better than my dad, but still a piece of shit. So that's <laughs> like it wasn't ideal. <laughs> but like yeah, I. I suppose, and I think, uh, like you say, the military is a, is, yeah. is a hub of of people that because I think the, they get attracted to the community, um, and there's a lot of people with a lot of issues actually go into the military. Um, not saying that we've got we had mad issues then, but um, you, you do find yeah. a lot of similar stories um, from from childhood. I think in the military, yeah, it's all it's all guys 
that are striving to do something different, but they can't do it down the academic route. Yeah, exactly. And they haven't so, quite found their, their way yet. So yeah, they go, go down mm-hmm. that route. Did you have a good relationship with your dad while you were a kid or did you have a relationship at yeah, all? Yeah, definitely. Like, like I give my dad a lot of credit, you know, like, because again, now I'm a bit deeper as a person, which I'll probably, we'll probably discuss. So <laughs> I'm the only one in, who really, my dad has a connection to now. So I'm the only one who speaks, my dad, I'm the only one my dad's got basically. So I've always had a, I've always stayed in contact with him. Um, and I don't, I don't blame him. He wasn't always perfect, but I don't blame him for the things he'd done at times because if, if I go back and look at his story, I mean, he was adopted multiple times, doesn't know who his dad was. His mum sort of left him as a kid, and so then his nan adopted him, and then his sister. Um, and, and obviously, I think he just, you can see where the, the pattern is going. He had a very bad childhood. He, was never, he never knew how to love. He was never taught love. Um, and he used... When I look back at it, he used violence to get attention and to, um, that was his protection, protective mechanism, you know, he was never taught what I was taught, you know, and I, and I, and why I think that that's important is because if I didn't, because people think in life, like you're either good or bad, right or wrong, but me, if I'm neutral, I think it's only because I was brought up by my mum and my nans, I went that way, like I could have easily went that way, you know. Um, mm. the, the pendulum's not always, you know, the, the, it depends on who your upbringing plays a big part in what, what direction you go into, you know? And, and, yeah. and I think sometimes yeah. if you do go that side, you can still, be, you can still go the other side if then you surround yourself with the right people, you know? So I never blame my dad for that path. He just never had the, the love and the support that I had as a, as a young kid. You know? Yeah. So then, um, what was the was the marine something that you'd always wanted to do like growing up through secondary school was it just like no. a spur of the moment thing like how did it yeah, how it did really it random. sort of how did the decision come in like yeah it was really random it was one of them a bit of a process of elimination like as in i didn't do very well at school i wasn't really naughty at school i had too much energy i couldn't really concentrate much i didn't do great at school i went um so my gcse's i didn't do very well I knew I hated sitting in a classroom and I knew I didn't like education. So that wasn't really an option. I had friends at the barber shop, so I used to be the Saturday boy down the barber shop. Um, but that didn't really interest me, but I was doing that, um, just sweeping the floor and be, hanging out there. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I went to the cinema and that was like probably the best marketer campaign they ever had, which is too aggressive now, they can't use which was the 99.99% need not apply. Uh, and it was the guy going under the tunnel. He gets caught on something. He gets stuck. When will you give yeah. up? And I just saw all these guys doing these crazy challenges. And it just lit something in me, like, where I was like, wow. Like, I want to, I want to. I didn't know about the military. Like, I didn't know anything. I just wanted to do the assault course. I just wanted to, to push myself. Uh so I literally just went home and signed up, went to the careers office and booked in at the careers office, um, knowing nothing about nothing. Like, <laughs> like most people who go, they have a bit of a military bearing, don't they? Either they're, the, the two, the, the main two is their parents or family have, have a bit of a military past, or they went mm. to like, they were into like cadets or some kind of thing. Uh, but no, that, didn't, yeah. that never interests me. Soldiering never interests me. I just wanted to test myself physically and that was it yeah i I was um my step my stepdad was in the navy um he actually went to the falklands but trying to get a story out of him was pretty difficult but it 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 still wasn't it still wasn't um it wasn't really like pushed on me like i I don't know my upbringing with my stepdad and my mum was more about like what job can you get that pays the highest it wasn't really about all of these challenges that you can go and do um in the military but like i i i was kind of like in the uniform services at college and was just trying to figure out like am i going to become a firefighter or am i going to join the military or 
you know, and then I was thinking, oh, you know, I was kind of steered towards the Royal Air Force because they were like, well, they pay the highest. Um, and what's what's the lowest level entry job that I can get that pays the highest in, in the Royal Air Force was kind of where I was steered towards. But actually, when I <clears throat> when I walked into the careers office and we spoke, I was like, well, actually, is it all about money or is it more about me wanting to test myself? Um, and also not having a fucking clue what the Marines was all about at all, really. Like, I wasn't one of those kids, like you say, that went to cadets and did did the whole nine yards and dreamt about it since I was 10 years old. Like, I, you know, I'd, I'd seen an advert, like, you walked into the careers office, they couldn't give me the job that I wanted. So then we spoke and uh, I ended up signing up. I brainwashed you into it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You manipulated me yeah, yeah. into, into I've done joining, my job well, but, um, I've done my job well. You did, you did, yeah. Did you get yeah. a bonus at the end of that? Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny, you talk about the adverts. That's a that's one thing. You talk about the adverts. Um, I was listening to uh, Alchemy, which is a book by uh, Rory Sutherland. And he talks about, um, obviously, they, they're struggling now with um, retention and getting people to sign up to the military. And I do believe that it's because the adverts have gone woke. Um, yeah. And it's because the the whole point of joining is that you you you're trying to attract the the, the kind of guys that haven't got other choices that need to um, get out of their neighbourhood or they have a poor relationship with their parents and they need that family um, sort of aspect or that brotherhood I suppose especially for the Marines. Um, and actually, if you change the if you change the advertisement to more woke, um, anyone can join. We can all be a part of this. It kind of loses the desire and the edge that it had before. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Whereas, like you know, I think you had lads knocking on the door. Like you turn up to the, you know, I don't know how many um, pre Royal Marines course weekends they did, but like it was a lot. I think there was one every two weeks or something like that. Um, and there'd be 50, 60, 70, 80 people, 100 people there every every couple of weeks to try and join. Um, whereas I don't know whether they're seeing that type of numbers now. Um, yeah, I agree. But... Like, I, I, I think, I think by sort of toning it down, I mean, I wouldn't have joined if it, like, if it was like, toned, I wanted it to be, to test myself the best of the best and like elite and all that kind of sort of, cheesiness cheesiness uh if when it creates it because it, because there's a role for everyone right so you can if you want to do something else or go into something else then that them options are for you so i think just leave it leave it to what it's meant to be isn't it like um you yeah. don't need to make it you don't need to make it for everyone because it's certainly not a job for everyone so you're just stitching yourself up anyway you're just wasting people's time yeah so how did you find the whole training process um i was shit i was really shit to start with um no hard like, like even getting in was tough for me um quite a funny story i've told a few times um i i failed the the educate you have to do the basic test don't you uh maths english science is really simple isn't it uh yeah i actually failed it too so Two plus two um, equals four, all of that. Yeah, it's so simple. But <laughs> I found it because, like, I haven't been given dyslexia as, like, a, I don't know if you're going to have to go and take a test to be told you're dyslexic, but I'm pretty sure I'm dyslexic. Like, it just takes me, I, I get things muddled up <clears throat> when I'm reading and writing, and it takes me longer. I have to go back and keep reading the thing. And that was the problem on the test. It'd be like pens down. It's like, mate, I'm on, like, question four. <laughs> you know, like, I haven't, I'm not finished yet. Uh, so even to get in, it was tough. I had to, I had to retake the test. They said I have to wait a year, or I I could go to college and then I can retake it in six months. So that's what I did. I said, okay, I'll sign up to public services like like you did, uh, and then. But he said, in the meantime, if you do the pre-joining fitness test, that's ticked off, and you won't have to do it again in six months. So it'll be. You know, the process will be a bit quicker. So I'd done that. When I went and done the pre-joining fitness test, because I aced it so much, well, I didn't know at the time, I just obviously just tried my best on it. 
two days into public services, Pete Chapel, you'll you'll remember Pete Chapel, were you? The, oh, the career, God. Jesus. career advisor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my so God. He God. rang me up after two days and said, "Mark, we got your um, fitness test scores. Come through. We're going to waiver the, the results as long as you go down to PRMC and do well down there. Um, they will sort of waiver your your RT test scores, uh, and that that's how I even got to start PRMC. And then obviously PRMC, as you know, the potential War Marines course. That's just physical, really." Um, I mean, you yeah. have an interview, but, but it's mainly physical. And that was what I was good at. Physically, I, I, I loved it. But um, the mental side of it, I was way off. I was I was way off. I remember turning up, again, because I was a, 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 I was a mummy's boy. I mean, I didn't do anything at home. My mum had everything always laid out for me. I didn't know how to iron, a, iron anything. And that's a big culture shock because if people don't know the Royal Marines, they have extremely high standards, but but not so much physically, they obviously do physically, but also admin, presentation, um, all that side of things is, I was I way under, really underestimated how how on point you have to be with that, that side of it. And I really struggled. I mean, the second day, you'll remember, you just get all your kit chucked on your bed, don't you? you, you go, you're going everywhere, going to the stores, getting your rifle, get, I don't think you get your rifle actually to start, but you get all your bits and bobs. Most people know what they're doing with all this because, they, they, again, they have a military bearing. They know roughly what everything is. I've just got everything chucked in my bed and I'm thinking, I ain't got a fucking clue what any of this is. And then they literally just show you the most perfect locker you've ever seen of everything immaculate. And they're like, right, 6 a.m. or probably earlier than that. Uh, locker inspection, everything needs to look like that. And I just look around and all these guys, I was, what, 17? All these guys are just running around getting on with it and I was just so overwhelmed I just wanted to sit on my bed and cry and probably call my mum uh but I had to just you know everything had to be iron creases down the middle um and it was so overwhelming for me and then I remember the first inspection that I had this is how this is how poor I was uh I missed the back belt loops with my belt so I didn't even have my belt through the belt loops <laughs> you know that the, the corporals come up to me and you have to say your number and I'm like, I couldn't remember my number. I'm like, P0. And he, and he just looked me up and down and he was just like, I can't remember. I think he was just in shock of how lousy and how much of a bag of shit I looked. And he just moved on, I think. Um, obviously got beasted later on. Um, and that was how it started. And it didn't really improve um, for about the first 15 weeks. Uh, I just slowly got better. But what always held me together is I love fitness. So what happened is I just got beasted constantly. You know, you just go on the flank and get beasted. Um, but I didn't mind that. I was like, and then also I was thinking, oh, I'm getting stronger. Like, mm. And then at week 15, so I'm rambling on a little bit. But at week 15, Sorry. you do a test week Baptist run, don't you? And yeah. I passed that. And that's your first, like, that's to say, right, you're, you're, you're okay. I managed to scrape it. I think I like, because I was, quite fit. I think I chased after someone on the night Navix so I could sort of follow them uh, a little bit. And um, I passed that and my confidence started growing. And then what I realized was I realized all the, all the pretension, all the tests that were like pass or fail were all physical. So as long as you stick in, as long as I could stick in, stick at it, I knew I'd get to the end. And then when I started thinking like that, my my um my confidence just started growing. And then by the end, I was actually, you know, one of the top guys, I guess, um, by the end. So it went full circle. It started off terrible and I built a lot of momentum in the last fifteen weeks. So I I suppose for you, um the commando tests were probably not too yeah, bad. No, like I was no, I didn't have to. I was. I used to get excited like that because I knew that was my bit. That's my thing. Like everyone's got their thing, ain't they? And I and I loved that was my thing. So mm. yeah, like I didn't. The commander tests weren't so bad for me. Um, anything physical, I went amazing. But I just that's I enjoyed it. Um, I liked. Yeah. I always had that part of me that I've actually enjoyed that side of it. So it never. It wasn't a punishment, you know. A punishment for me would be like. You know, kit, um, you know, kit musters and all that sort of crap. That used to do me in. 
but getting thrashed like weren't so bad. Um, being on dirty yeah. recruit, I don't think they're even allowed to do that anymore. I mean, that was like the worst thing ever. Um, dirty recruit, basically, if you if you mess up or you fail admin tests, they can put you on dirty recruit, and then every throughout the night, every six six p.m., twelve p.m., six a.m., you have to turn to a different area of the commando base with a, a kit must have laid out or, or something silly yeah. that, that they make you do. And that was, that was, um, Matty, were a lot worse. Matt, Matt, Matty Green did that to me fucking yeah. on, um, <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, cause you get to, you get to the later weeks in training and yeah. they are fully aware that your admin slips off, right? Because they don't focus on it as much. They're more, they're more training you for soldiering, for the commando tests, going on exercises. Um, and ultimately, I think we got, I think it was like week 30. So it's really late. And then you do start to like slack a little bit yeah. on your admin. They treating you a like, little oh, bit more as, yeah. Yeah, they're treating you, but also it is programmed for sure to check everyone, right? On those weeks, because they know that everyone's going to slack yeah. off a little bit. Um, and I just, I think I'd just come off, it was like test week, you know, test week where you practice all your commando tests. Is it, it's called like death by commando. Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, anyway, you do like the. I oh, cheat cheeky Wednesday. You do cheeky Wednesday, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Like um, cheeky week, cheeky week. That was yeah, it. Yeah, cheeky yeah, week. Yeah. You do two um, commando you tests do in like, one day. <laughs> yeah. You do, you do like, oh, this is like the pre, this is the week before you actually do the test. So like it's, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd, it was the first time ever that I'd had like, uh, webbing rash on the bottom of my back so you know like yeah. um a lot of lads would get i never really got any issues with my feet or my lower back or anything like that when we were going on like long you know yomps and stuff um so i didn't really think anything of it but i had a bit of an issue with my lower back and i was like oh, i'll be all right and it was wednesday you have to do wednesday beds where you change your bed sheets and wash <laughs> them every wednesday and i just didn't do it and i'd woken up in the morning and I must have had like some level of bleeding on my lower back. And then no one did Wednesday beds because we were like, oh, we haven't been checked for a few weeks. And then I just remember Matty fucking over the, over the fucking balcony in front of everyone screaming, Aaron. And I was like, oh, fuck, what have I done? I was like hoping he was going to say, get me a wet or something, which is like, get, go and get me a cup of tea or a coffee or whatever. And he just hung my bed sheet over the fucking thing in front of everyone and had blood down the middle of it yeah. from my lower black. And it was just like, I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake, like how embarrassing. Cause that's essentially what they do is they're just trying to embarrass yeah. you in front of everyone else to see if you'll quit. Right. But yeah, he made me go and do the 12 o'clock. Was it 12 o'clock kit inspection? Like whatever it is in the yeah, drill yeah, sergeant yeah. shed yeah. at 12 o'clock. And then the fucker didn't even turn up. So the guy who, whoever the duty shithead was, what you realise was the guys that go and do that, the duty fuck ups, corporals yeah, that yeah, are fucked yeah. up on the weekend, and they have to go and do it for the recruits, right? But he, yeah, I turned up, was standing there for about twenty minutes. I was like, this bastard is fucking still in this bed. He's, yeah. he's like made me come all the way over here, get dressed up in my love it, and I'm, he's not even there. But that, that was all part of it, wasn't it? Like all the, yeah. all the, um, I knew that it was all just bullshit. And actually, as long as you passed your tests, like your your every Friday, there might be like a twelve mile speed march or whatever it might be. Actually, if you could get through all the other shit in the middle of the week uh, and just try your best and realize that you're just getting fitter and stronger, um, yeah. then was, as long um, as you passed a training dip. This um, it's quite it's quite inspiring. So I'll spin it as well. I I, I um, I've, I've spoke about this a lot to other people about my journey in training. So like I said, I was doing terrible and I was on one of the early exercises and I was really lucky. When I talk about inspirational people that have helped me in my life, like when I say about not having a father figure around, I was one of them. I think a bit like you because Matt, Matt, he was a good corporal, weren't he, Matt Green? Uh, yeah, he was really good, mate, yeah. And I was lucky my corporal was inspiring, you know, because some corporals can get lazy, can't they, when, when, when you're in training and stuff. Um, they're all good, but there's different levels to it. and. My corporal was really inspiring. Anyway, I was on this exercise and I obviously wasn't doing very well. And he said, look, Mark, recruit level. All I'm going to give you is the head, head, the radio headset uh, for this exercise. So that's your bit of kit to look after. Hand that back in and do the, do the exercise. And you've, you've done, you've, you've passed the exercise. Could you do that? And I'm like, well, yeah, that sounds pretty simple. 
um, on about the second night in. I used to keep that headset at the top, my top flap, my Bergen, so I always wanted to check it was there. About the second night in, we got bumped. Like being bumped is like the the training team will come down, fire some blank rounds to simulate that you're being attacked, and then you have to get to an RV point. And obviously, in the middle of the night, I think I've just come off sentry, wet and dry, my stuff's everywhere. I'm flapping, trying to get everything in my Bergen, get to the RV point. Uh, he pulls me to one side in in the morning. And he says, like, recruit level, like, how are you getting on on the exercise? Like, yeah, yeah, all right. Um, have you got the headset? And I say, yeah, it's in my, in my, in my Bergen corporal. I said, okay. He said, it's definitely in there. So straight away, I know I'm fucked. I thought, no, this can't be in there. <laughs> and um, obviously in the morning, they've swept the harbour area and he's found my headset. And he said a couple of things that honestly, like, changed the course of probably training and my life a little bit. Um, he, well, first of all, he said, Look, there's two options. I can I can speak to the troop troop commander. There's a good chance you're going to get back, troop. We know we're not doing very well. Or we can keep this between me and you. And this can be the turning point for training. He said, what I want you to do is get some paracord, put it around the headset. And then whenever you're in the field, you're going to keep that around your neck as a symbol um, to sort of remind ourselves of, the, of, this, of this turning point. But he also said, I want to give you some advice. He said, you will not complete this course until you believe you can complete this course. And it took me a while for that to sink in. And he was so right because before I just doubted myself on everything because I was in this alienated world. And I just looked at everyone else as they were so above me. Even though I had this like raw passion and fitness within me that I knew I could do, but everything else seemed so far away. But until I realized actually as long as I apply myself, like I have something that other people ain't got because I've got that determination physically, I'll, I'll be all right. So it kind of mentally switched in me thinking I just thought about things different because before that, I just completely doubted that. I was just there for the sake of being there. I didn't think I was actually going to get there at the end. Um, and, it, and it kind of, I always remember, remind myself of that when I'm doing something now, like that if you don't actually think you're going to do it, then there's a good chance you're not going to do it. You know? Yeah, that was one thing. I had a really good training team as well. Uh, people like Matty and we just had like some really, yeah, just some really great guys. Like it actually was a bit of a, it was a bit shit going to unit afterwards because <laughs> you actually then, down. you then see what, yeah, yeah. It was a bit of a letdown. Like you actually see what some of the blokes are like afterwards. But obviously they've just let themselves go a little bit and they're they're kind of plodding along yeah, in their yeah. careers but they're not really yeah. but the, like training teams are obviously you know highly respected individuals um and they've it's done right, it i think like bit. a lot of the time when you're going through when you do go through that training you don't realize that the pti is also a soldier and a lot of these guys have already yeah. done tours of northern ireland uh, you know iraq afghanistan multiple tours yeah you kind of see them as a training team, but actually these guys are, you know, they've been recruited essentially from commando units to come back because they're exceptional to then train the lads and put them through training. But yeah, I was quite lucky as well. We had a really good, really inspirational. And that's the reason why I think 16 of us passed and four of the lads are now in special forces, which is yeah. a pretty high number for like a small group of blokes. Um, but, but yeah. So where did you, so where did you end up afterwards? So I, I let, when I finished training, I went to Fleet Protection Group up in Scotland. Um, and I worked with Matt Green, your corporal up there, actually. Uh, I, I was in his troop for a bit there. He was just a Marine at the time, though. He wasn't a, he wasn't a corporal, he was a Marine. Uh, I'd done a lot of the UK-based security stuff. So the convoys where the nuclear warheads would get transported up and down and would do basically protection for the UK assets is where the nuclear submarines and stuff are. Basically, a glorified security guard is a pretty boring job, but we had a good group of guys, and that sometimes actually makes it. Um, but I always had a burning desire to. I wanted to go on. I wanted to go to Afghan, and I wanted to get to a commander unit. And yeah, so I just kept putting in basically for to, to go and do that. I, I was meant to be going to forty commando, but they were already out in Afghanistan, and I knew. If I went there, I might have caught the, the, the back end of the tour, but not the full end. So I actually asked to 
get to four two commando because they were the, the lead commando unit going out next. So I I I done a couple of years at Fleet Protection Group and then down at four two commando. Um and then from there, yeah, went on done Afghanistan and all that stuff. Talk to me about the um build up of training to towards uh, leaving for Afghan. Hard, mate. Really annoyingly hard. Like because like life on a unit is quite it's easy when there's not much going on. You know, you, you, you could be done at mm. two, three o'clock in the afternoon, can't you? And then everyone just goes to the gym, gets massive, and then goes out on the piss, basically. Um, but yeah, like that whole Afghan period was tough because the build up to Afghan six months was well, seven months and three days on, uh, on Herrick 9. But then you do six months of beat up before you even go out. So then you're doing like, basically like simulation, like going out, doing training exercises, getting you ready to actually go. And it's, it's actually, some of them is harder than actually being out on ops because they, I guess, try and make it that way. So they get you back ready to, to then sort of go out. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty shit because it's all the stuff that you want to do as a soldier, but you haven't actually, you're not actually really doing it. And you've just, yeah. when, when yeah. you're not in training anymore. So obviously every exercise, as you'll know in England, um, when you're just doing a training exercise is really, really boring and just cold and wet and seems pointless. Yeah, simulates Afghan great, doesn't it? Like cold, yeah. wet. Again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk to me about the, so the, um, you do your beat up training to go to Afghanistan. You're going on, this is Herrick 9, right? Yeah. Um, and you're what, 20? Yeah. Uh, 19, 20? 20. 20, maybe 21. So maybe 21. Maybe 21. Okay. So you're 21 years old. <clears throat> you get on the plane. What's that first sort of thought when you're, you're in your uniform, all the boys are there, you land, and you're like, basically, you're about to, because I suppose you land, you land in a base which is well established and basically pretty safe. Yeah. Um, and that's the and real then, misconception that's, about what? Like, that's the big misconception about Afghanistan that it used to trigger me, but it doesn't anymore. Is realistically, when you've someone said they've gone to Afghanistan, it's like you automatically think, like, this is going to sound pretty rude that, oh, you're a, oh, wow, like they've gone to, but for 90% of people that go to Afghanistan, like, it's just as secure, really, as in the, it's actually easier. Than being in a commando unit because if you're in Bastion or Kandahar, these are right in the middle of the desert with like McDonald's, Starbucks, fucking all sorts of facilities and swimming pools and everything. It's like you know, and and the workload's less on on, on the base. So a lot of people are just like playing football, sunbathing. Um, I know that sounds maybe a bit harsh, but then it's only really like obviously infantry troops, commandos, paras, special forces that actually then leave the bases, go out on the ground, do ops that are actually, you know, getting the rounds down or whatever they're doing, or if you're based in these FOBs, not on the big secure air bases. So, so I mean, to answer your question, you fly into an air base and there's no danger at all. So it still doesn't feel real yeah. or anything yet because it's like you're just on an air base walking around, seeing everyone just like, there's like, you know, quizzes and fucking whatever they're doing on there, you know. Um, you know, it's, the, um, the nappies and stuff, you know, Pizza Hut and just doing yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah, it must be a bit of a surreal experience because you've got people on those bases that will potentially be there. A lot of, it, especially obviously the American soldiers, they're there for a lot longer. They do twelve months stints at a time or whatever it might be, um, and some of them will just be admin staff yeah. in these bases or chefs, chefs on the McDonald's or yeah. you know the fitness instructor or whoever it might be, and essentially they are just admin for and they're still doing a fantastic the... job i'm not discrediting Correct. their job it's like you know they're, they're away from home you know in this environment and it's still you know so alienated to their normal home life don't get me wrong but i think mm. sometimes you have to remember there's all different jobs in the military that people are doing in afghanistan you hear afghanistan and everyone just they're they're four War zones to fight yeah. in. but that's a very yeah. very small minority of what actually happens sort of in there, you know, there's this yeah. country with air bases that 
just the same as being on a unit back in the UK. So you you spend X many days acclimatizing, I suppose, to um, the heat and everything else, hydration, fitness, all that type of thing. And then yeah. where did you end up doing the majority of your ops on Heric So 9? to start with, so we, so we were two things. So we were really lucky. We were strike <laughs> operations. That means we get to fly in to wherever the objective was from anything from 24 hours. The longest ops were like three weeks and then we'd, we'd fly back out to the, the base and then basically repeat. And the, the other thing that most units will do, they'll, they'll, they'll stay in FOPs, forward operating bases, which they just have to protect and secure a certain area. And arguably that's definitely, um, it's certainly not as exciting because you're stuck there all the time and you've just got to basically secure that area. And if they just IED all around it. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, well, it's dangerous and boring, but we were lucky. My, my, my unit had strike ops, so we could fly in and fly out. Um, and to start with, it was still quite boring because we were in Kandahar for about two months. So it was kind of an easy transition onto the ground because Kandahar is not so uh, hostile. Uh, our first, our first sort of transit out of there, one of the, one of the vehicles went up, got hit by an IED. So it was a quick introduction into it. But in general, there wasn't much firefighting going on around that area. After two months, it was getting really hot um, in, in and around Helmand. So we, we, we went to Bastion and then would fly in and out. And that was when it was much more aggressive. Talk to me about um, the, when you say it gets aggressive, um... What were some of the what were some of the key moments on your tour that that stick with you and probably still stick with you now um, that you look back on and you go, "Well, that was sketchy." Yeah, I guess two two things. Like the first one is most of the time when you, I mean, on these ops, then you're pretty much in firefights all day, every day. It's like a normal routine for them, like the Taliban. They'll wake up, pray at breakfast, and then they'll pick their weapons up, come and fight, and then they'll put their weapons away and um, go back into with their families, you know, and like a normal, and then come have another go in the evening. But generally this fighting is like from distance and, and it's not like, yeah, of course it's intense, but, you know, you can, the lads will sleep in firefights because it's, it's quite far away and sporadic and they'll never put you in, you know, it's quite rare that you see from the movies that you're, you're that up close and personal, but it does happen. So like there was this time where we were clearing through compounds and as you clear through compounds, it's just how it works. One section will do one compound, the next section, section of like six guys, eight guys, sorry, will do the next compound. And my compound, my, my section, we're getting ready to go into a compound. The compound is like obviously a, block of buildings of basically where, where people live. And we got told, we knew there was enemy in and around the area, but we didn't have no in, intelligence to say that they were there, you know. And I was second person to go in. Griff um, was my point man. We entered the compound, stuck up on the door, and rounds just start hitting the door. And... Um, I'm like fucking sh shit. So I kick the door down, thinking there's someone in there because my my head's just scrambled. As I've turned around, there's a guy literally three three or four meters away, if that. Probably with a PKM, which is a massive machine gun, yeah. But it's got such a kick on it that when you fire it, unless you're, you know, obviously he wasn't that um, skilled on it. So as he's fired it, it's just gone up. And hit all above the door frame. You know the door's just getting pelted with it. So we've got down on our belt buckle. We've gone round um, outside the compound. It's about a, it's probably a four foot wall. Um, they've actually thrown grenade over, but luckily they're like old Russian grenades, and it, it didn't make kick up the kill zone on it. I guess wasn't very good. It wasn't that accurate, but that's how intense it was. You know we're throwing grenades back in. Um, we get on the, the 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 net to the boss, and we're like, look, there's obviously Taliban in this compound. 
we didn't weren't sure what to do at the time, so he asked us to withdraw back to the, the compound that we knew was safe. So we've gone back into that compound, sort of explained there's people in there. Uh, they've radioed through to the, the higher boss, what do we want to do? And it's part of our job to take that compound. So we put in support and we start firing into the compound like other sections are, but we get told, because we knew the layout, that, that my section is going to go back in to take the compound. That's your job at the end of the day. Um, and that was the only time where it felt real. Like before that, it's all firing from distance, you know. And yeah, we're, we're, t we're, we're taking out a lot of people, but it doesn't feel that close to home. Uh, I remember, so Cotter's my best friend from there, he's Special Forces now. Um, he, that, that was the only, that was the moment where I said to him, look, if anything happens, tell my mum I love her, you know, because we knew, you know, and that was kind of like back and forth. It was kind of that word with each other. It's like we knew it was um, going to be Hairy, close. Yeah. We didn't know who was in there. We didn't know if there's still people in there. Um, there wasn't firing coming back, but we didn't know if they were already like fucking being hit or what. And we went into the compound, you know, grenaded every room. And when you do that as well, people don't realize like the discipline and all that training kicks in how, how professional you have to be when you grenade a room and you take a room out. Cause it's all right doing that in going through drills. It's when you grenade a room, as you know, it makes such a fucking bang. There's so much smoke and shit gets kicked up. You can't see a thing. And then you're going in there live yeah. with your oppo and you've got to sweep the room. You can't even see him. You can just hear him, you know, and you've yeah. got to sweep that room, you know, far and into the corners. One goes up, one goes down. And we just done that through the whole compound. Um, and it was a great success. At the end of the day, there was casualties, none at none from us. Uh, but like you say, if, you, if I could pick out two moments, that's obviously definitely one. And, and we actually said to each other, before you go into to, to war as such, you always want to get the rounds down. You know, everyone just talks about, I want to get the rounds down. I want to fucking you know, mm. I want to take people mm. out. Um, after that, we sort of said to each other, if we don't get another round down, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy, it was yeah. kind of like, you know, it was, we felt like we'd done enough. You know, we, we kind of, you know, you, you really want to do something, you've done it. And then it's like, like oh, um, and that was a really strange experience, right? Because afterwards, obviously there was the, the dead bodies were in, com in the compound. And this is how strange war is. Um, I don't know if it was that night or the next morning. Families start coming towards a compound. And that's obviously, sometimes that's quite scary because they IED people. Another, that's another story. Um. But anyway, friend, sort of women and children start walking towards the compound, sort of hands up. So they come in, and, and that's the sad reality of war. That was their families. They wanted to take the bodies away, um, which we let them. Um, and that's kind of like the sad reality of it, where it hits home. It's like, you know, that is someone's uh, father mm. or, or, hus or husband, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Um... I used to I used to kick myself probably for about I don't know must be two or three years after I left left the Marines because I kind of joined at the end of everything and the Marines was going through the first it was probably the first time in fifteen years where there wasn't a war going on right so it was Northern Ireland then it was Iraq then it was Afghanistan and you had stripees that were in the Marines that were like had been to all three places. Um, and some of the guys before that, Falklands and everything else. Um, but <clears throat> I remember leaving and thinking, um, oh, like I didn't really get to do my job. I mean, obviously I did my job, but I didn't get to, I didn't get to go to a war zone, you know, and you do anti-piracy and, and things like that, which sounds cool, but actually it's quite boring. Um, <laughs> but if I look back on it now, um, like 10 years later, and I actually think how lucky I was not to have to get into yeah. that sort of thing. Because when you look at the political and you kind of do after you leave, you kind of look back at what was the meaning of it all, what what was the what were the politicians thinking, and the shit show that happened with Biden pulling out of Afghan and basically just fucking destroying fifteen years of work in the space of twenty four hours was just like I think the next day the brigadier of the Royal Marines hung himself. Yeah. 
because he's probably yeah, sat you, there full you, of guilt. At the time, thinking, you, don't, um, you don't think about all that stuff, but obviously now going on, and I think that's a lot a lot of guys have actually PTSD and problems from. It's not always the, what they've actually done and that is that you think a little bit more deeply about it later on. Um, because we do, you know, mm. you, you, yeah. You, at the time, you don't think about what you're doing. You're just doing your job. Um, mm. Yeah. They're, 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 that's definitely uh, one incident. I mean, there's an, another incident, Christmas Eve, which will always be like deep in my memory. Because um, a good friend of mine, um, he would, you know, we would get the train. We got the train to Afghanistan. He lived in Norwich, so we'd get the train up and down, you know. Um, he got killed with us on um, Christmas Eve. So, like, we got ambushed. And that was the first time that you, that was the first reality of war that happens where it's like the show goes on and it's really weird because obviously before that lads have been hit, you know, we, we had plenty of people that got fucking hit, but lucky and even from like IEDs and stuff. But when it's like as close as that, basically we, we were ambushed. We were, we were, we're having a fight. We're all on the roof. People are on the rooftops firing stuff. He had a LASM, which is like a, a rocket propelled grenade thing. Um, you have to fire it from, you have to kneel to fire it. You have to be, you can't fire it from the prime position land down. So it's too dangerous to fire, but everyone wants to get rid of them because you can only fire them once and they're just ha hassle to fucking carry. So he's got up to fire it and he got shot through the neck. Um, he was dragged down off the compound, giving him CPR. I mean, the medic wasn't, I wasn't. Um, but you're watching it, but you can't stop because you've still got a job to do. And it's so weird, you don't get that time to grieve, grieve you know. Um, so it's really weird. And then this is the other thing that would then piss you off when you, re you realise people are just a number and the fucking things to them all. We get on the net to the boss again and we're like, someone's been hit, you need to fucking, you need to pick it up now. And they wouldn't land, they wouldn't come and land, you know, to come and pick him up because we were, it was hot because we were under, a, you know, too much enemy fire. And they're basically, their rule is that like an aircraft is worth more than a, than a, than a human life, I guess. Um, that's how they look at it. I, I, maybe not as blunt as that, but you know, that's. Yeah. Yeah. That would, yeah. The bones of it. So we actually then had to carry him under, we were still under fire. We had to carry his body about 500 meters like away from the zone to, for him to get airlifted out and then to come back. And that was like Christmas Eve. And then like, then it's obviously Christmas day. They, they, um, didn't get to ring home in the morning. Obviously that'll come out on the news. So then you, the parents are at home and, and all the rest of it. They hear that on the news. Probably that, that breaks out on Christmas day. They're the two incidents where you, they're, they're the, they're the, they're the lows, you know, there's a lot of highs still though of Afghan, but they're definitely the two lows that would that I'd pick out. How how were you how did you cope after Afghanistan? Like how long how long was it after Afghan that you left the military? And then how did you cope, like looking back on your career and everything that had happened? You know what, like my thoughts on it have changed a lot over time. Like so, so it was basically after Afghan and everything, I, I, I then went back to my unit, um, got injured, um, damaged my ankles, nothing to do with military, just um, one playing football, one falling down the stairs. Uh, so I, didn't I was a careers advisor for a bit while I was downgraded. And then there was that was when all the money started going around for the private security um, work, you know, the maritime work, private security work. And I had some friends that were doing it. They kept asking me to go out and do that, join their teams doing that. Um, and then eventually the money, because I still loved it, to be honest. I still loved the military. Um, then I wanted to go on and progress. Um, I was a young acting corporal and I was a real young lad, you know, at the time. But, yeah, the money got me in the private sector, basically. So I left and then I went into the private um, private security work, maritime security. and done that for a few years. So I think that transition, I'm still kind of brainwashed by it all, you know. I'm still not really... Um, I don't think it was affecting me at all at that point because I've gone from one industry into the same sort of industry. 
Yeah, you um, go from military to military almost because the private sector is owned by military guys. I never really guys. reflected too much about that. Hmm. Pardon? I was just saying the it's it's one of the reasons why I didn't go down the close protection route because generally lads go down like if you're young and you haven't really got loads of life experience when you leave it's like well I can go and do close protection or secure some sort of like high level security or I can go down the fitness route and become a yeah. personal trainer or whatever because like, that's what your day was basically it was like going to the gym twice a day and it was it was sort of a simple transition but that was partly my thinking behind leaving and not going down the close protection route is because I felt you I'm going to be in this military world still because ultimately those companies are ran by ex-military guys yeah and you're Last surrounded months, yeah. by ex-military guys yeah so yeah, my company how, had to be was... sorry mm. yeah you had to be a marine <clears throat> or special forces um that were the only they were the only two requirements to even get into um pvi i worked for first of all um yeah and it was run by an ex bootnik um but that was that was great. I, I mean, I loved that. Um, but I still loved that whole. I still loved the. That was still me, you know. I still loved it all then. And it was just like basically the Marines, but without all the bullshit. You could do what you want, and we had. I could work when I wanted as a young lad. It was it was it was it was just good. Yeah, I. Uh, for the first two, for the probably the first two years, and then like anything, it got shit. Um, we the, the company got brought out. Loads of other people, the market, and started getting flooded. Lots of other security um, companies were setting up. Everyone was undercutting each other. The the conditions got worse. The loads more rules and regulations got involved. Like literally, when I first went out, it was a four man team. There was no, there was nothing really. You just work with your mates, you fly out, um, and you just, we were making it up on uh, as we went along, you know, because it was so new uh, that, that, but it was great. And I'd get off a job and then we'd be put up in a hotel, all expenses paid, um, earning really good money. And yeah, it, it was just, it was, it was, it was a really good couple of years, but it progressively got worse. Um, money started going down, standard of the lads started going down. Loads of people started getting into it. This was when um, essentially maritime like ships, it became yeah, like it, an insurance policy it was like the, situation, the, the, the wasn't it? Captain Phillips happened and stuff. Um, the, the film Captain mm. Phillips, obviously that's a true story. So it was around like 2011, I think. Uh, and yeah, basically a lot of the, the, the vessels were getting hijacked off of Somalia for, for insurance money because they, they knew it was an easy an easy they'd take them in insurance companies would have to pay out for them to be released you know wanting they'd want like 10 million but there's a billion dollars worth of fuel or something on board if it's um you know oil tanker or something so they they had to they had to pay the ransom and, it, and then yeah it was happening quite often like it was happening it was a two or three a month um was it was happening to and they obviously they're the successful ones they're obviously getting attacked daily at the start yeah so when you finish this contract and it sort of you know the 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 decline of that sort of career um in maritime security you know obviously a lot of chinese companies started coming in as well and you know charging a third of the price or a quarter of the price and it kind of drive lads into just being team leaders and um, then just not anything like anyone could go and do it. Essentially it's just bodies on <laughs> bodies on a ship. Right. Um, when you actually finally made the call when you were like, that, this is it, I'm going to go home now. And actually um, you spent the so last two things I were don't know, eight years. One, I was getting older and my, my this is where my, my thoughts and, things start change, it started to change, you know. I always knew deep down I had this burning desire of being a, a, a parent. Like, I, I, I always knew I wanted to be a dad and have this family and, you know, I'm a very passionate father. And I, and, and, cause I was still very young. I had the, the, it was a great opportunity for me to look at all the guys I was working with are generally a lot older than me, you know, 
I was still at this point in the security. I'm still only what twenty three or four, twenty four probably, maybe yeah, twenty four, twenty five. Um, and the guys are like thirty five, forty, and there's a common theme happening. A lot of them were divorced. I would say functioning alcoholics, moaning that they um, their wives are screwing them over for their pensions because there was a high rate of that going on um, because of this lifestyle, you know. And I knew I didn't want that. But I didn't know what I wanted to do um, because I didn't have the quals. That's all I ever knew, you know, so I didn't have nothing else to, to, to fall back on. But as the as the industry just was getting worse and I had this pull, I eventually just decided, you know what, like I need to I need to leave. And it, well, all it was actually was they, were, they, they, they moved me from one job to another job. Uh, which I didn't really want to do because they wanted me, I was a team leader at the time, they wanted me to head up this new contract. It was a Chinese vessel and it was just shit. And I said, um, basically, no. They said, well, you can't pick and choose what jobs you do. And I kind of said, well, I can. I'll just send me home. And they said, well, if I send you home, you're not coming back out. So I was like, all right, well, just don't send me back out. So I kind of pushed myself into a corner where that was it. Kind of. Mm. But after that, you get into... Is this when you go back into Barbara at this point? Sorry, it's cut out a little bit, I think. That's oh, all right. Yeah, I was just saying after this, is this when you go back home, back to sort of Haverhill and then get into Barbara after that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, in between that transitional period, I was thinking about stuff. So I applied for the prison service. Uh, but again, I failed the, um, the, the written stuff on that. So I couldn't even go into that. So, you know, my options were, were, were limited. Um, and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, who the mother of my ch children, um, she was a barber. And I knew everyone from the barber shop in Haverhill. Because that's where I grew up. So I used to sit down there a lot anyway. And I thought, maybe I'll just do this. And it was kind of like a bit of a joke to start with. People were like, really? But I honestly didn't have that many options. There weren't much else I could actually do. Um, so, so yeah, I just started cutting my mate's hair in the shop, um, sort of, and they just trained me up. But, but I always knew that weren't going to be enough for me. Like that was, like it was never going to be enough. So as soon as I could, I already in my head knew as soon as I could cut hair, I wanted to have my own shop. Um, and then that happened. And then I guess I replaced the rush of that life. I started looking into and enjoying business stuff and, and the business life. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. I started cutting hair, but literally I owned my own shop and I could just about hold a pair of scissors. Um, and then went from there to opening multiple shops um, over the next sort of few years. So during this time were you were you um struggling at all with your mental health were you seeing mm. a counselor at this point not, not at that time i probably was but again you're in denial yeah. um like i don't know when it i've had i've definitely had struggles which i'm happy to talk about i don't know i think when you when you struggle I used to think I, used, when I started struggling, I used to just blame Afghanistan, you know, oh, you haven't done the things I've done. You haven't seen the things I've seen, that kind of shit. But actually when I reflect on it, it never really was. I never, I've never had any like doubts in my mind of anything that I've done that has sort of kept me up at night. I can fully hand on heart justify anything that I've done. Um, so I, I don't really even understand fully what PTSD is, you know, because I have had counseling, but I haven't done the whole military one. I just paid and done my own private stuff. So I'm not sure. I don't like to talk about PTSD because I, I, I don't really know the the ins and outs of it all. Um, I don't know whether I have or haven't had PTSD. Um, but what I've gone on to learn through lots of counseling and self-development is I struggled massively. Even though when I started barbering, and I had a business early and I had multiple businesses early. My community and who I was, I wasn't proud of. And when I was in the military, as a young boy, I was so proud and 
like the person I was, I had value. I had, I mean, it's, it's put everywhere in, in the commando, the commando ethos and, um, you know, all the commando values. And I felt very proud as a man. When I'd done the barber in, I just felt normal. And I know that sounds terrible, but I've never wanted to just feel normal, you know. And then I would start, I always drunk a lot in the military, but I would start drinking. Um, I never, I never done a drug in my life for the military. I'd would, I would hate people that did drugs, um, but I got into cocaine. Um, and I just felt then I started my sur- I felt like I just started being someone that I wasn't proud of. And that was the demise of me. I don't think I used to blame the other stuff, Afghanistan, and that obviously had an impact on me, but actually the demise of me was, um, or I don't even know what that, that, that's the right word to use, but was my community and my circle and the person I was, I wasn't really that proud of. And I, and I give up on myself for a few years, you know, where I was just going through the motions and like drinking for like from Saturday, then it'd be Friday. Then it'd be Thursday, you know, like every other, every night I'd have a couple of pints or something after work. I stopped doing my fitness. I stopped doing everything that made me like for me, my fitness and health is like that. That makes me who I am. When I stopped doing all of that sort of stuff, things just started unraveling and, and, and pretty quick, you know. The it's it's a it's a tough transition actually because you. You leave the military and all of your circle have completed something pretty extraordinary at the end of the day. And you're all motivated in a certain way. And the environment that you're in is a one-off environment. That's not, it's not normal. It's probably not fit for society really in a lot of ways. Um, And then you leave and you're trying to get back into this normal world where your sense of humor is completely different to everyone else's because it's extremely dark. You know, even just trying to transition from a swearing perspective was pretty difficult for me. I remember getting told off on the bus once for effing and blinding, but because your natural habitat was being surrounded by 600 other blokes on a Marine base, um, it, it was, it was a struggle just to get back into normality where someone someone who wasn't as fit as you or could be as aggressive as you or could get into a, a section attack or a firefight or whatever it might be is telling you off or and it and it is very difficult to get back into that friend circle that you're proud of because a lot of the a lot of the people that you were with um they've been through all of this shit you've been through all this shit with them together and then you go back to your hometown, wherever it might be, and your mates from school are still, you know, they're doing okay, but they're in corporate roles or, you know, they're, they're going to the pub on Friday and Saturday night and that's their life. And, you know, when we used to get summer leave, you know, eight of us would bugger off to Thailand and go traveling and, and, and do exciting stuff. And you're going through this mundane and you kind of get sucked back into it because, you know, it's a bit like that saying, like, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And you're surrounded by all these high level people and individuals. And then suddenly you're not surrounded by those people. And especially going back to the countryside, it's more difficult, right? So we're obviously both from Suffolk. It's not like going to London where you can find more entrepreneurs and more people that are aspiring to do better for themselves. It's very difficult to find those people in Haverhill yeah, yeah, yeah. or Newmarket. There is, there is a few of them, but there's not as many as you would get in a city environment, you know? Um, but yeah, I, 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 I can see what you're saying with that. Cause even, even transitioning, I lived in Dubai for a bit. I lived in Sydney, obviously, but it is difficult to find your circle again after you leave an environment like the military, where you're all on the same page. Yeah, massively. Like <laughs> I, I, um, in my, it's written in my testimonial when I left the Marines, it, it, it said you'll gravitate like Mark will gravitate to the top of whatever um, setting or whatever he's in. And that actually makes sense to me now. Sounds a bit big headed, but like if I'm in a bad setting, I'll gravitate to the top of that. You know, if I'm in a good setting, I want to gravitate to the top of that um, sort of setting. And, and I just remember like little things. I'll be at a wedding. Nothing, obviously a wedding's a great time, but if you sit around the table, you know, 
And it sounds really rude, but just no one interests me. And that sounds terrible. It's just because I've gone from this to this and I'm thinking, I, I don't even want to. So I used to just think, I'm just going to get absolutely hammered. Um, and then I'd get hammered and I'd do stupid shit. And then like, you know, it was just a repeat thing every week and, 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 and mm. until it was just getting way out of hand. Um, but I don't blame other people. Like, obviously, I'm not talking about other people. Yeah. I'm, I was always the one to blame. But it was just for me, um, yeah, that, that transition. And even as a boss, I had to learn very quick. I couldn't understand when I had my first shot and people were late and stuff and, and, and all this. And I just thought people were fucking useless. They're pathetic. Like, doing a job, the bare minimum, just could, and, 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 and I got aggressive. And, like, if you ask some of... I've got some staff that were with me still. Well, my first ever apprentice is now I own a shop with. If you asked him how I used to be as a boss compared to how I am now, I mean, it's, it's just chalk and cheese, you know. Um, I, I had to change everything about me. And that was the hardest bit. And I think that's the hardest thing from people that leave the military. When, 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 even from the, the, the suicide rate, um, obviously there's plenty of people that have committed suicide and drink, drugs, all that sort of stuff. I would like to know actually how much of it is PTSD and how much as it is just the community has been taken away from you um, and, and you haven't found that new person yet because you have to like, make, you have to create a new identity. Um, otherwise you'll just struggle. I think. Uh, yeah. I, I've said this before to people is that ex military guys that constantly talk about the military still after they leave need to change they can't like you you're not that person anymore and it they'll it will be it will be plastered on the walls everywhere every time they're in a bar they'll talk about you know their time in the military and stuff but you're not that individual anymore like i think yeah. about it now it feels like a lifetime ago yeah yeah you know i'll talk to i'd know people for like a, like you know a year in sydney and then they'll be like oh what would you do what were you doing before this so i was like well you know i was in the military and then i went to dubai after that and that's where i met my wife and then she's Australian, so ended up in Australia. And they're like, oh, we didn't know you were in the military. It's because I don't identify myself anymore as a military. Like, I'm not. You know, I'm a dad. Yeah. I, I run a business in Sydney. Um, it's, you know, I do a podcast. Right? But it's yeah. that the, me being the former Royal Marines commando, which was probably my story for about five years after I left. Yeah. That's just, yeah, I you have to create soon realized story, that it's like... not. Yeah. yeah, new chapter. Yeah, yeah, because there's still guys now that will constantly talk about that, and you know that it's yeah. just not it's not healthy for them. That's their story at the pub constantly. You know, that's what they, they their identity is. They've got to change their identity, get a new one. Um, otherwise, they will struggle and they will fall down that path. There's a book by Johan Hari. I don't know if you've read it called Lost Connections. It's quite it's quite it's quite I, a good I, book. I know the talk. book. I haven't read it, but I know the book. Yeah, I've to a couple of podcasts yeah. with him on. Yeah. Yeah, so he, the book Lost Connections, it talks about that is um, essentially dr drink, drugs, alcohol, suicide. A lot of it is just down to loneliness. And it's more about you not being in the environment that you want to be in. So you end up isolating yourself. Like you say, you go to the wedding, um, you don't relate with anyone at the table. And you just sit there and just think, oh, fuck it, I'm going to drink myself to oblivion and have a good time by myself at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of fact, what that happens makes with a lot sense. of military that's, guys. That, that makes a lot of sense to me because in my journey, what used to happen to me when it got, then I got bad is that's when I knew it got bad. I would go out. So, so like addiction, I don't know if I was fully an addict addict because it, well, I get really frustrated about addiction because I speak to some people that I think have a problem and they're like, so I don't drink all day, every day. Well, I didn't drink all day, every day, you know, but mm. I, I didn't have control over it at times, you know, when I drink and it starts lonely and ends lonely because I used to go out and it, when you said about that lost connection, it makes sense to me now. Um, and then I'd make an excuse and sometimes I'd just go to, if I'd be on a stag do, I'd just go missing. I'd just go back to the hotel room because I didn't want to be around people. I just wanted to sit in the room and do as much whatever as I could, you know, get as much drink down me. I didn't want to just have, you know, drinking at the bar. I wanted to be off my head um, in the hotel room. And I didn't want to be around other people seeing that. So I used to hide it a lot. Um, but it, it makes sense. I just didn't want to, I just didn't have a, a community or a connection with other people at times. Yeah, yeah. The, um, obviously, like, 
you've got multiple businesses now yeah. successful in your own right with regards to a from a business um standpoint um you've i've noticed actually which is one of the reasons why i wanted to get you back on the podcast is um the you've you've i feel like you've had a switch mentally recently over the last 12 months yeah, yeah. you know getting into this online coaching and everything else what what was the because it's a complete shift from what you're actually doing what your what your day-to-day yeah, yeah. income is i suppose is is yeah. your barber shops which you've got loads yeah. of now uh and the gym um and now you're going down this coaching route what was the inspiration behind it what work did you do on yourself to then essentially switch your mindset to then get back to who you really were i suppose it's rediscovering your identity yeah yeah so yeah first of all i've always obviously flirted with pt and obviously i own a gym well as you know you were part of the gym um so I own a gym. When I left the military, I I actually done a premier training because you know you get resettlement uh, money, don't you? So I obviously I like fitness, so I done a premier training six week course and all that. I did do all my quals and stuff like that, and then I just didn't fall into it back then. But it's always been part of my life. Um, how did I get back into sort of coaching now? So I when I was struggling. I started going on my self-development journey. So I, there was there was a sort of a pivotal moment where I was like, enough's enough. Um, I hold my wife a, a, um, a lot of credit to that. You know, she stood by me for a lot. Um, and I just knew that I had to change um, when my kids come and all the rest of it. So I stopped drinking, stopped um, everything. I just started working on myself. And then there was another guy, there was another uh, coach actually, um, Damien Scannell. He's a... Uh, I just see him keep tweeting stuff and I've resonated with it loads when I'm talking about this community thing, you know, he was like, he's like intense. He's like, but he's big on, um, obviously he was really fit doing all that sort of stuff, but his real mindset as well and family man and all his values I, I connected with. So I reached out to him and I started working with him and I worked with him for about two years and we built an amazing, um, sort of connection. Um, and, and, and again, I found inspiration from him. Uh, he kept telling me I should coach just because of my story anyway. You know, I've done a lot in business. You know, I own lots of different businesses. Um, I was really getting into my fitness. I was started doing fitness events. Um, I, I owned a gym. So he was, he was sort of, he kept telling me when we were on these calls together, I would start almost coaching him as he was coaching me. Throughout my businesses then, I went for a whole new approach of, instead of taking people on, we started just uh, having apprentices or trainees as such, and I would mentor them um, throughout the business. Um, and then I've gone on to own sort of some shops with them. So I started really enjoying that whole, whole mentoring, um, coaching, as you will, sort of uh, work. And I guess, well, two things happened. One, I've wanted to just put all that together as a package because I've got a lot of life experience. I was into fitness. I've got businesses and people kept asking me questions anyway, you know, and, and I thought maybe I'll just do some coaching and sort of put it all together. But another thing happened along that whole journey. Um, I lost a friend as well through suicide. Um, and he actually reached out to me a couple of times, but it was when I was struggling. Um, myself and I didn't feel that I, I hadn't gone through my self-development journey yet and I didn't feel that I could help him and, and there was times where he was reaching out and um, I kind of dismissed it because I knew if I got with him it was the chemistry to, to I couldn't help you can't help someone until you, you're help you know you're in a good place yourself um, but yeah. that's always played in my mind so I think he, he, he actually took his own life um, someone I was in Afghanistan with and it always played in my mind so I've always had this sort of burning sensation ever then if I can help someone I want to fucking help them um, and that never left me so it's a combination of everything I think I just started wanting to coach and I just love always challenging myself and pushing myself 
to get better. So one of the things I done in my coaching, I don't know, as you know, I'm still probably not great talking on the camera, but I was terrible. As I started developing in business, I started getting asked to go and talk to people or go to meetings. And I was very good at times talking on the phone, but in this context or standing up in front of people, I would get actually, I would, all my anxiety from school would start coming out. Um, and I would, I would have this imposter syndrome where I didn't on the outskirts, I had multiple businesses, but on the inside, I, I, did, I felt like a fake. And I wanted to get better at that as well. So I, I started going to Toastmasters to learn to get better at talking to people. And I guess just as I've gone on this self-development journey, the Toastmasters, the talking to people, the, I wanted to put that all together in a product where I can, I can do that. A little bit like this podcast for you, it's a hobby, but then you turn into a business. Mm. So it started to me, I just wanted yeah. to help people. I wanted to talk about my experiences that might help other people. I don't care what other people think, you know, and it started getting traction and then I sort of made, turned it into a business, which actually now I'm more passionate about than any of the other stuff because it's really my true, it can't be anything other than me being authentic because everything I talk about is just me, you know, I mean, my experiences, yeah. my struggles, the highs and lows. Um, and if that helps someone, then so be it. If not, then don't fucking listen to me. You know? Yeah, I'm the same. I had a... We we were talking before we obviously went live, and um, I did a really inspirational story with my friend Connor, who's essentially just um, beaten the odds with cancer. Right, he was given eight weeks to live, wasn't going to make his thirtieth birthday, and now he's completely cancer free. And he came on the podcast and shared his story, and um, I think we, you know, we effed and blind a little bit as we as we have today, which is just me. It's me being authentic. I'm not going to change who <laughs> I am. Um, couldn't give a shit. And the, um, the some of the comments are hilarious, right? So um, I don't know why it went viral, but it must have gone viral somewhere in America because it was just like God, God needs to save you from blah 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 and all this <laughs> stuff about me swearing. And I'm oh, sitting yeah. there like. You know, I you you're you're preaching to the wrong choir on this one. Um, so, um, well, my but it is, yeah. But it, it it's just it's just one of those things. I I don't think um, I don't think the way that I that, anyway it doesn't really matter. I don't care. But the point the point is like you just said. Then if you don't like it, don't listen. Like I'm just not interested. Um, you start it as a hobby. You know, I've soon realised that this could potentially become a business i got a notification the other day saying you're almost ready to monetize your youtube channel which is weird because i just started it as a talking to some friends and then suddenly people were reaching out on instagram saying can i come on the show um and then yeah it, it, i didn't realize how many people actually um <clears throat> you know would want to be a part of it and, and, and join it so yeah but it is it's just like a hobby that potentially will become but if it doesn't if it remains a hobby that's absolutely fine but you know if it if it if it does um if these stories inspire other people and it ends up going down a business route as well that's also fine because that that ticks my entrepreneurial box as well yeah um, and, I, and, and i think that's the best message and, and actually people are looking at getting into business and stuff like if you can be authentic and it's so much easier like because if we come on here and talk you know, you try and act a certain way and stuff like that. One, it doesn't come across that great. And two, I just think eventually you'll either fail or you'll just stop doing it because it's not, you know, it's forced, isn't it? Like, and then yeah. when you can just relax and, and, and just be yourself, it takes so much pressure off of, of everything. The only negative of that is you have to try to realize that you're not going to please everyone with what you're saying. Or some people are going to disagree with what you're saying. As soon as you start learning that no one really cares and all that sort of stuff that you hear on the motivational stuff. Um, but you have to believe that. Once you actually believe that, it, it just frees you up and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and you just enjoy it a lot more. It takes the pressure out of business or whatever you're doing. Yeah. So I, I always say I say to people, you just you follow what you enjoy and then you yeah. figure out how to monetize it later. So it's... 
it's like the reason why I got into owning the gyms was because I really enjoyed fitness, but also I help I liked helping people who were had poor diets and you know bad relationships and they hated their job. And actually, a lot of being a personal trainer isn't just the logical side of things, which is move this weight to get fitter. It's the psychological side of things where it's you know someone's had a really bad day and they come and train and they feel much better when they leave which might mean that they make a good decision which would have been a bad decision had they not come um whether that's in their relationships or their work or their business or whatever it might be um and then obviously you you do that and because you care about it you end up getting more clients and more clients and more clients and then suddenly you go oh i can make a business out of this you know open a gym like we did and everything else um but it it's it is for a lot of people, especially people between the age of 20 and 30, always think like, what's the worst that can happen if you can sleep on a friend's couch or go back home? You've got nothing to lose. It's only really when, you know, positions like we're in now where you've got kids, family to think about, you've got bills to pay. You know, I think if you're between the age of 18 and 30 or whatever it might be and you're still single or maybe you just got you've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you don't have kids yet you you've got the freedom to go and follow whatever you want to do right yeah, definitely. you don't need yeah. to you, you're not you're not um there's no constraint what's the worst that happens you end up going back home and rebuilding and starting again like it's yeah a couple of points yeah like from that so the first one a bit like again when you asked me how did i get into it and when we're talking about do what you enjoy doing like because I had all these other businesses, like you said, but I didn't actually really enjoy them that much. I just got into them and then I enjoyed business. So I was getting more businesses, but I wasn't actually getting that fulfilled with them. It was just seemed like I could just keep getting businesses because it gets easier the, the, the longer you do it, just like anything. Um, but the coaching, I actually enjoy. I love that side of it. So that's another reason why I just did it, I think, um, because the businesses were, yeah, they were doing fine, but I was losing that enjoyment from it. And the second point you made, which is a really good point, I use an analogy back from the military, um, from the principles of a stalk. They say, take risks early. So if you're trying to stalk the enemy, you know, when you're further away, you can take more risks and move up quicker. And I always use that when I'm talking to young people in business. One, if I'm talking to someone about business, I'm very careful of the, the information that I share because you've made a brilliant point is, Depending on your scenario, your age, there's so many factors depending on what advice you should listen to. So if I'm speaking to someone who's 20, like you say, with no kids and all the rest of it, my advice is going to be different to someone that's 40 with two kids, a mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're young, you should definitely take as much risk as possible because like you say, um, what, you know, if you're at worst case, when I started, I was sleeping on Kerry's mum's sofa. You know, we, we started again, you know, I wanted to save my money for the businesses. So move back in with our parents. Um, so if you're willing to do that or whatever it is, worst case scenario, you've got parents that you can go and live with. You're in a, such a fortunate position to, to try to, to do these things. Um, and yeah, so that, that basically like, that's, that's the message I was trying to say there. Like depending on the advice is different depending on the age. <clears throat> yeah, you got the flexibility to fail harder, right? Because you haven't got the mortgage payments, the car loans, the yeah. you know whatever, whatever it might be. When so 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 who who is your main client base now? Look, talk to me through. Someone calls you. Um, what, what who are you seeing as your sort of like? Uh, so like everyone main says, you should have a, a niche, don't they? Like you should you should target men between 30 to 40 who who uh want to be this <laughs> you know that's that's what all the gurus will tell you to do and, and i thought about that but one i'm i'm really lucky because i can be in a position where if i don't have any clients it doesn't matter because my bills are paid okay so i can be really authentic with this now and i can really you know um i don't have to push anything i don't want to push so that's one thing it frees me up um so who who do I want to work with? The truth is, I don't fully know yet. I've got a, a range of people from, I've got some millionaire business owners, um, and I've got some, the other sort of walk life who are struggling, young youngsters that are struggling. Um, I get just as much 
enjoyment and value out of trying to um, coach both ends of the spectrum. But really, the, the main focus of it really is just health and fitness. So it's mainly just training, you know, um, because not everyone wants all this other deep stuff that I keep talking about. Some people just want to work with me and they just want to get fit and strong or lose weight. So that's fine. I do that with some people. But then I've got other people that are struggling with addictions or, um, that are str or wanting to set up a small business or that kind of thing. So I kind of just incorporate with my experiences into so it's very it's very broad at the minute because obviously like you say my story is quite broad so i just basically jump on a call with people they tell me what they want and i kind of just tailor it to them a little bit as i go on yeah obviously i'm going to get a little bit more selective or and and, and and narrow that down to a to a certain um uh, i guess more niche but at the minute it's just it's just very very random and um uh, free with it. I think that's almost better because I someone said to me the other day they said, "Oh, what's your podcast about?" And I said, "Why does it have to be about anything? Yeah. I can get anyone on I want." Yeah, I said, exactly. "I want to talk to people that I want to talk to. I don't. I don't. The soon the, the moment I go down a niche. So someone said, "Oh, you know, you're a mortgage broker now, and in Sydney, you know." surely you're going to want property guys on. I had a property guy oh, message me property. yesterday. Yeah. yeah, but like how fucking boring is that? Um, yeah. There's only so much of that you want to do, like, isn't it? It's like, well. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, my friend circle isn't finance and property guys. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, that's my, that's my job. Like I, I, I enjoy the business. Um, I'm in, I invest in property myself so I can understand how it can help people. Um, whether they want to get ownership because they want to have their own property, which gives them a level of security so they can go to their school catchment area or whatever it might be. Um, you know, they want to grow wealth for when they retire so they can, you know, have multiple investment properties or do a renovation. You know, it's just something that everyone is interested in. Um, and, and I do it myself. So I was like, well, the, you know, it, it does it. It's not a hard sell for me because I do it myself and I can see the benefit to others. But People will say to me, you know, you've got to do a property podcast or a finance podcast and, and then that's your, you know, how come how come you got this uh, ex-con man on who's turned his life around? I'm like, because I want inspiring stories in, yeah. on the podcast. I don't care really. I don't, I don't care about having a niche. Like, you know, the biggest podcast in the world is Joe Rogan's. He hasn't got a niche. There's no niche. Like actually niching it, closes off so many other people that I want to speak to. Um, and actually, you know, getting, yeah. getting, uh, military guys on getting, um, more, more about inspiring people, inspiring stories that people have turned their life around is more what I'm interested in because it gives people that haven't got anything or in the dumps. Um, it, it gives them a, uh, something to listen to, which they can then turn around and go, "Oh, that, that's what I need to do." Or actually, well, anyone my can relate to that. Then, toxic. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah. People can relate to all them different stories. Because what I've actually found really hard with my coaching to start with is, again, when I do, I obviously have a passion for more deep conversations, deep, meaningful conversations. But when I just try to do that, certainly with men, um, it takes them a bit longer to a want to open up so, so so it's not cool to come and um obviously everything's i keep things confidential but still men are a lot more harder to to jump on a call and be a bit open and talk about things uh which i've definitely noticed so it's slow to start with because people are like, oh what the hell is this guy acting all tough now he's talking about all this pink fluffy stuff um and <laughs> like i found it it, it was all I just thought this is going to be a slow transition into it. Um, so what I found through fitness, because fitness is like a common language everywhere. So that's my main focus of it is the fitness now, like health and fitness. And then if people then want the added extra of picking my brain at any of my ups and downs, I can, I can offer that. But like um, I, th I found it easier to, to, to properly, I guess, target more fitness related stuff, losing weight, getting fit, getting strong. Because that's a bit of a, obviously the theme as I've spoke about. It's always been a passion of mine. And now I am back into doing stuff again. 
I'm, I'm, I'm doing like fitness events and stuff like that. So I guess I can see myself, I can see me pushing myself in that. And then I guess I'll get more clients going in, in, in that element, you know, functional fitness and stuff. With, with regards, let's, let's end on this. With regards to your physical and your mental health now, what do you do between Monday and Sunday as your sort of routine, like uh, training, nutrition, mental? Like what's your, what does it kind of look like for you now? Good question. I think I'll answer it by saying, when people say like, what do you do for your sort of mental health and things like that? It's more what I don't do. I'm very aware of what I, I don't need to do. You know, so as long as I, I, I don't associate, I don't hang with people that, that affect that. You know, my circles are a lot smaller now. I'm, I'm, I, I just surround myself with, with, with good people and that seems to help a lot. I create structure in the military. You have a lot of structure, don't you? And that works well for me. Um, so I'm very structured now because I have a lot going on. My week structured, you know, um, I have time for training time for my family time for my work time for my business and that's all structured ready to go so then i get stressed i don't i don't worry too much when i'm doing my fitness i don't have to think oh i'm i feel bad because i haven't spending time with my kids because my, my children's time is all structured you know um, and that allows me to relax um nutritional wise i'm not like mad on on nutrition i just very simple like most people if i eat shit i feel like shit so i try to avoid eating shit but some days you just blow out like like we all do. Um, but fitness is a big thing for me. I, I love it. Like I've, I've, I went off the rails with it. Like I stopped it when I was going through all that. But now I'm back on it. Like I'm getting more and more. Um, yeah, I, I train. If I don't train, I feel, I don't feel, I'm climbing the walls. Um, so it is a big part of my life. And, it, and I think it always will be. Um, and it keeps me in check. It's my thing, you know. Everyone's got a thing, and, and that's something that I've, I, 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 I had a passion for when I was young. I lost it, and now I'm getting a passion back for it. So, are you? Um, are you do it? You did a high rocks event last year, was it? No, I was meant to do. I done Affix Games last year, which we actually okay. me and my partner we got to the uh, finals, but we I had a family holiday in Thailand, book, so we didn't actually do the finals um but we're doing it again this year so i hope to do well in that um doing a high rocks pro event in october um another functional fitness event so yeah these sort of functional fitness stuff that you'll keep seeing everyone they're getting very popular now aren't they hybrid a lot of people call it i don't know if you say that sometimes people get offended i don't know what you're meant to call them i just love basically pushing myself going to them and and um yeah i'm still nowhere near where i want to be but i'm ambitious with it like i've got a goal by the time I'm 40, I'm 37, like I want to be turning up to these events and people knowing me, you know, I know that sounds ambitious, but that's my goal. You know, I want to, yeah, I really want to get after it. So in the next few years, I want to be turning up and then be like, yeah, Mark Lovell's here. Like, you know, it's going to be a, it's gonna be a it's good gonna event. Smash it. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, Maybe I'll the... do that, you know, maybe not. I'm just talking crazy there, but in my brain, that's what I have to have. I have to have these big goals to push me because that's what i enjoy you know yeah yeah well maybe you and matty will be competing then because i've seen yeah, so no, i've been reaching out the, to matt now because matt's matt's better than me matt's doing really well um he's a better runner i'm probably probably beating him on some things but I, I, I know he's a better runner so um we've already spoken about doing a high rocks together um and yeah i think that will happen in the in the near future Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, mate. Appreciate your time. It's good to catch up. Um, I'm going to put all of your details down in the description. And if you are, do you do international clients as well? I would do. I haven't got it yet, but maybe yeah. from this, well, we go. Have, uh, yeah, well, reach yeah, out. Yeah. Right. Well, if you're in Australia, you just got to make sure you get the timings right. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to reach out to Mark and, and, and get stuck into some coaching, uh, self-development, fitness, nutrition, that type of thing, then, uh, then reach out. But thanks for coming on, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah, great. It's been great. Thank you.